Hello, welcome. welcome, welcome to the view. Yep, it must be Thursday morning because it's another hour with some fun-loving Unitarian Universalists talking about all kinds of stuff. We have a special guest today, uh, Reverend James Ford, and James is the minister at First Unitarian Church of Providence, or is it Unitarian Universalist? Did I botch that already? It's First Unitarian Church of Providence, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Aha! And James is the first Unitarian Universalist minister duly credentialed also as a Zen priest, a Soto Zen priest. So we'll be talking some about that. James blogs at patheos.com, a blog called Monkey Mind, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in the meantime, I am Meg Riley sitting here in a weird hailstorm, flash flood, freaky weather thing in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I am Patrice Curtis, and I'm sitting here in gorgeous weather that we may have, uh, may get up to 95. <laughs> I am Hank Purse, and I'm speaking to you from lovely Medford, Massachusetts, and it's lovely. <laughs> and I'm Tom Shade, and I'm here on a rainy day in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, it's dreary here sometimes. Okay. I'm okay. Sometimes, like, sometimes life is dreary, but yeah. you're okay. Yeah, uh, you yeah. did break up just a little bit there. Breaking but, up is uh, hard to so do. So Tom, <laughs> yes. breaking up is kind of easy to do on Google circles sometimes. And we have behind the chalice, we have Shauna Foster, our tech person. Shauna would want me to remind you that you can tweet at hashtag the view, V U U, the view. And you also can write your questions right there in YouTube, and we can pop them up and answer them immediately. So please be part of this. Tom Shade, you made blogging news this week. What? Tell us about your blog that people are buzzing about. Oh. Well, Sean was going to put it up. Let me see. But basically, I just put up a post this morning on what uh, I, the four key <laughs> learnings. Hold on. That, I'm sorry. I forgot this feature of Zoom. <laughs> Sean has put it up, but at least where I am, it's like an inch square. So. Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't see it anywhere. I don't see it anywhere. Where is it? The only way that Shauna could show it would be if Shauna read it out loud, and so she took the large screen. I forgot this about Google on the Air. Sorry, folks, it's live. But there it is. Shauna's showing it to you in that tiny little box over there. So maybe you want to tell people where they can find it. Well, do you yeah. want me to talk so everybody uh, can find it? There we go. Just Sorry. say something for a minute, Shauna. Just say okay. what it is. Oh, there it is. Here is TomShade.com. Ooh. Ooh. And this is the blog post that people are talking about. Core statements of liberal public theology. And it's a really nice shareable graph here about the world is unfair, but it gets better. The opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. You can't hate somebody after you hear their story. Everything causes everything. And that's four key learnings that guide liberal public theology and then boring, 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 boring. <laughs> <laughs> Kill me now! Kill me now. Oh, nice, Donna. That was nice. <laughs> I want a, a public, little public theology that I can understand like an Ikea description, like no words, just pictures. There you <laughs> go. Put it together. Well, I think you've got it. I think you've got it there. Swedish names. So, Tom, what is everybody, what's, what are people the most... Uh, well, after that, we're going to... Well, uh, this is just getting kind of like a positive, a positive... I've been kind of banging on... Uh, you know, public theology for a while, trying to compare liberal public theology with with conservative public theology, and trying to uh, get to something deeper than uh, the goldenrod color to tie together what we, um, you know, what our public ministry is about. And uh, you know, I I started out, you know. Um, I mean, James, you know, is an inspiration to me on this, you know, because he always talks about the first and the seventh being, you know, Schmagel. I, 
you know, which is okay. But you know, when you start talking about principles, nobody cares because except you use because you know nobody else knows our principles. So, uh, so trying to state these things in words that are uh, straightforward and um, that also represent kind of cutting edge non um, non platitudinous uh, statements. Um, you know, was kind of what's driving this one. You know. And, and just things that after a while, you know, I, I found myself saying over and over again uh, that, that, you know, you can't hate anybody when you, once you hear their story, which it really gets down to, I mean, I think that's where the first and the seventh principle come together is that as soon as you really try to understand a particular individual, you end up understand, being confronted with the systems and structures that make people act and do and feel and think the way they do. So as soon as I hear your story, I'm all of a sudden into everybody's story um, in a certain way. What so was your, What was the fourth one you had up there? It was... Uh... Everything causes everything, okay. Or uh, the world is unfair, but it gets better. Everything Anything causes everything means that? Wait, no, no, oh. everything... Everything causes everything. I think it's like a restatement of our seventh principle. You know that there's a we live in a world of incredible mutual causality, and so therefore you cannot isolate anybody's, uh, you know, anything that's going on from everything else that's going on. So everything causes everything. I think that's succinct. <laughs> now, James, when I read that, I see the dependent co-arising. Uh, Right? Is that what you're constantly doing? Is seeing Buddhism and Yuyuism kind of fused together as you look at Tom's things? Uh, do you, do they resonate with your Buddhist self and your uh, Yuyu self? Uh, I guess I, I, the short answer is yes. Uh, I, I I think Tom Tom is putting his finger on on. I, I believe we have two great insights as, as Unitarian Universalists. As, as Tom said, the drum I keep beating is to call our hearts to what, what were the intuitions that underscore the first principle and the seventh principle? To me, they need to be taken together to, to really work. But when they do, you get things like Tom's meditation. Uh, we have something to offer. It's not unique to, to us, but we uniquely attend to it. And mm -hmm. I, I believe I get to bring a Buddhist uh, wash to it. I think there's a Christian wash to it. I think there's a humanist wash to it. But it's something we, in fact, share. And, we, and what I wish we would spend more time on, truthfully, rather than branding and other things uh, that we seem to like to do. What would it look like to spend more time on it? In your dream world, what would we spend our time doing? I, I believe several things. Uh, one is I believe we're, being, we're, we're called into an authentic life where we genuinely see the preciousness of our lives and, and each other. Uh, we do see it's an imperfect world and it, and we feel, a, I, I find in my experience of this, uh, a desire to reach out and be of some use in the world. Uh, and this comes back to Tom's public theology. You know, it, uh, I believe we are called to an interiority of experience and it is a bit of a weakness for us, although I, I do like that a lot of people are picking up on, on some of the Buddhist practices that hope open us, us to that. I think there are other disciplines uh, that we have, and we could even go into the small group ministry as a spiritual discipline. But we, we, it, it, we do that, we gather, we reflect, and we act. And, and we've got something. We've got a saving message here, and uh, it is something good for the world. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, because I didn't want to. I can, I can talk at some length on this subject. Well, and you do. In other words, he's holding himself back. <laughs> but I, I guess, you know, going back to the Tom thing, I really do wonder do things get better? You know, is, is that, isn't that just, aren't we just setting ourselves up? For another, um, you know, onward and upward forever, and then the first world war comes, and everyone goes, oh, you know, it, it mean, uh, like, you know, it, I don't know. I, I guess I, I always, I always feel caught on that, you know, on that things always get better. I think, um, 
I, I think the temptation is always to think that they don't, but um, I think when you take a long view of human society and human culture, you know, well, you know, people carry out the same, um, you know, kind of emotional desires that, you know, the social structures improve. Uh, social structures get more complicated, become uh, over time uh, uh, more complex and more interdependent and meet more people's needs. So and, and the main point I'm trying to make with that is that there's not a golden age in the past, but what's in the past is even worse than what's now. Um, you know, yeah. uh, basically all systems, states, economies, etc., were created by the imposition of power of the strong over the weak. Um, you know, there was no social contract. You know, there was no point in government to protect our rights. No, the first government was formed when somebody said, hey, you know, I want your stuff and I want your daughter too. And, uh, and, uh, and what are you going to do about it? Uh, that's the that's the origins of uh, human social life is um, is power um, and uh, and so actually we're moving forward away from that so I don't know you know what like, I, I know I, I always think of like you know Vikings walking by like you know abandoned Roman aqueducts and going what the hell is that thing you know <laughs> like, yeah I know you know like well, it yeah. always get better gets gets worse too you know so well it's, it's uh, uh, but, you think about government systems like the Iroquois Confederacy. You know, in some ways I out. think you're right. You know, people. For me, the I think the the point, the relevant point in the, in this basic optimism is, I find to be alive and to be open to our human experience is to be hopeful, and and yeah, there's there are rhythms and and. I mean, you take a long enough view, and we're all dead. I mean, <laughs> all of us. Yeah, all, all of us. Of us. Yeah. Some of us sooner than others. <laughs> Cornell West differentiates between hope and optimism, and says that optimism is the belief that things are going to turn out, and hope is kind of an existential knowledge that, however they turn out, what you're doing is what you need to be doing, and it's on the right path. And I, so, in that way. He says, and, I, and me too, he's hopeful, though not always optimistic. And I think um, having reason for kind of existential hope is, is a, to me, is a decision that I make. I mean, I could tally up evidence and, and maybe say, you know, the iceberg's melting, let's just give up now. Um, but I decide that I want to have some power to act, you know, and I think that that kind of agency is a part of us. I did want to say though that governments like the Iroquois Confederacy had figured out a ton of stuff that got eaten by the United yeah. States, you know, and yeah. so it's not, I mean, I just think sometimes how we think about government evolving is told by the eyes of the victors, that's all. So um, anyway, I just wanted to name that. Well, you know, I think that's uh, I think that's a a particularly um, modern twentieth century uh, position of privilege is a certain way to say oh things just stay the same things are just you know rotating around in the endless circle of life as it was five thousand years ago I mean I think you have to go uh, no. Not really, not for most people, and not for a lot of people. And uh, and and to have any, I mean, what I contrast this with is either the notion that and everything just rotates around and it's always the same, or the other, which is the much more decisive and majoritarian view in our culture, which is that things will not get better until Christ comes back. And then they're going to get terrible, and then things will get better. But that's what the majority of people in the United States believe, is that things will not get better until Christ back, comes back. That human society's, you know, basically doomed, you think, you think which is part majority, of God's plan. You think the majority of the people in the United States... Oh, think, well, let's not quibble about not, the statistics. Let's say a vast, <laughs> a, a very huge... Why would we do that? <laughs> 
Is it because you're living in Michigan? Is it because you're living in Michigan? A plurality of people, if you take the polls in the United States, a plurality of people believe that human culture will not change until Christ returns. Uh, some people do think that, but I, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing so I, that. I, I think, Tom, that you were right. I just wanted to pick up. I think it is a, a, it is a privileged position to think that, oh, yeah, things are going to stay the same because, um, you know, if you're living in, in relative comfort, then things staying the same is not so bad, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're living in you know, poverty, or you're living in one of our many, many, many neighborhoods that is racked by indiscriminate violence, meaning, you know, your your kid can be shot while they're sleeping in their bed by a stray bullet, mm -hmm. you know, you actually don't want to think that things are going to stay the same, you know, you, you know, that's, that's, right. a, that would be a very hard way to live, I think, you know, but if you're in that... Syria or Iraq, I mean, that right. would be tough, so, so I think that's, that's a, a really good thing to remember. That's like the existential decision I'm talking about, though. You know, like that you, you need, you need to know that things are going to get better, and you know yeah. it. I mean, it's that a way yeah. out of no way. Like it is going to get better. Yeah. And, and I um, think that, I think well, uh, I believe. there's something about that being the natural. I sometimes wonder if that's the natural set point, at least, of humans when they're young, when they're they're kids, because you see kids in in incredibly hard situations. And they actually have this resilience that is uh, so, sometimes breathtaking, you know, and, and just in your light, <clears throat> in your heart goes, thank goodness, you know, because, uh, you know, it would just be a really tough way to live if you're five years old and seeing some things, you know, that folks see, so. Yeah, yeah I yeah. heard. Go ahead. Go ahead. But no, Tom, go ahead, Mac. Okay, and, and uh, I hope you saw that. You were instructed to quit wiggling your head so much by Shauna. Um, so, because we <laughs> lose you think. sometimes. We just lose some of what you say. I was just, I, a parent told me this story this week that kind of sums that up. Her kid, who's five, has been hearing about global climate change at school. So they're walking down the street, and he says, do you smell that? And she says, smell what? And he says, pollution. And she goes, oh, yeah. And he goes, do you know what that's doing? She said, no. He said, it's melting the polar ice cap. And he said, do you know what that means? And she thought he was going to talk about polar bears. She said, no, what? He said, he burst into tears. Santa's workshop is flooded, he says. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, here is somebody who should be thinking about Santa's workshop, who's hearing about global climate change, and in a way, I'm like, I'm going to preach that, because that's kind of how a lot of us approach um, believing that we have any power in the world, and I think what you're saying, both of you, is we've got something, it's real, it's good, we need to take it out there and stop sitting around like we're worrying about Santa's basement, you know, like, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I just thought that was the most touching story, like, Here's this kid who can do nothing with this information, being kind of terrorized in the name of environmentalism, and um, and but a lot of us still feel like that, you know, like ah, what can I do? It doesn't really matter. I might as well just turn on the air conditioning and you know whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think I think part of what Unitarian Universalism does is demand that we hold our own agency, and that that's mm -hmm. part of. Um, inserting ourselves, not waiting for somebody else, whether it's Jesus or, you know, some other more powerful human being, that it's about stepping up ourselves, which I think is a really profound feature of who we are. And I don't feel like, I was talking to Lindy Ramsden. Lindy's going to be doing the Berry Street Lecture at General Assembly in the UUMA days. She's talking about her years as an activist. And so she's been calling and talking to lots of us who have been doing justice work and really trying to get at, like, why why don't we take seriously that there's stuff we could know about how to change the world that we need to know in order to do it well? And the way that we know that about preaching or religious education, we kind of think anybody can do it. And um, it's a really interesting question, I think, why, um, why we haven't taken seriously not only our own individual voices in the public, but our collective voice. As you say, Tom, beyond the goldenrod shirts. I mean, I'm 
You know, I love me them goldenrod shirts, yeah, but me too. <laughs> you know, but we need a little bit more than that. And why well, why are we so resistant to that? I would I would say that the reason why we're so resistant to that is that we've come through forty years of right wing dominance. And we've had beaten out of us any notion that we could be effective in the social in, in the world beyond our own little churches. And, and uh, that's just the political, social, cultural reality that Unitarian Universalism has lived in almost all of its institutional life. And we are only now beginning to think, oh, you know, there's people out there and they may actually want to hear what we have to say. They may actually want to hear it. They may actually not want to, like, you know, um, insult and berate us if we stepped, if we, you know, raised our voice in public. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's an incredible, I think all discussions of Unitarian Universalism has to start with the question, with the understanding that we have been in a hostile culture for 40 years. And that's almost. When do you, when do you start memory. dating that? When, do you, when does your 40. Starting my, when? My 40 years starts in 1969, the election of Richard Nixon. Really? Because James, I'm wondering what I'm wondering. Nixon did. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Because oh, uh, Nixon was the first one to figure out that you could build a majority in the United States by uh, 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 demonizing uh, hippies, uh, 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 liberals, uh, the black movement, uh, you know, and, and all that. He was the one who first said, oh, you can stitch all these things together into a majority and turn people against progressive, ch build a majority against progressive change. And he did, and it was successful, and Reagan perfected it, and it's ruled our world until really, you know, just within the last few years, it's changed. A different majority has been demonstrated. You know, hmm. Everybody so I'm wondering if James, if if James, kind of agrees with that. If he's seen the difference between Zen Buddhism, you know, and Yuyuism around this public, I guess, public face might be a way, or this. Sure. If it's this hostility that you're talking about, I'm wondering if there's a parallel or. If, You've seen that people have, you know, sort of embraced Zen Buddhism and pushed away UUism, and and I don't mean UUs, but I mean just sort of society in general. Well, you've been. Right, it's an interesting question because uh, uh, while I think that Unitarian Universalism is a weak on spiritual practices side, Zen Buddhism in the West is. James, come back. Uh -oh. He's having a Zen moment. <laughs> He's meditating. Oh, come on, Google. We were all so interested in hearing that. <laughs> it, 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 I really it, wanted to hear the answer. It, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a koan. Shauna suggests <laughs> that we take a moment to reintroduce ourselves since we usually forget. Uh, at the halftime. So I'm Meg Riley with the Church of the Larger Fellowship here in Minneapolis. I'm Patrice Curtis in Concord, California, also with CLF. I'm Hank Purse. I'm uh, the interim minister at the First Parish Church United in Westford, Massachusetts, just north of Boston. And I'm Tom Shade, and I am in Ann Arbor, Michigan, retired, and I blog at uh, The Lively Tradition. And maybe while we're waiting for uh, James to come back, uh, Shawnee, you want to show his blog? Because he does blog regularly, and he is gone. Oh, uh, hopefully he'll come back. I did want to... Um, just Tom, meditate I was, on James coming back. Good question. Yes. Tom, I really wanted to, to thank you for kind of delving into this, um, to this issue that I've actually wondered about, which is um, us not sort of claiming our voice uh, you know, why we have this social justice perspective that, you know, we sort of can't do anything or can't have a larger voice, I guess, because I would, I really want us to have a larger voice. And as, uh, you know, a, 
just learning my craft, I have been struggling with this. You know, I also work uh, part time with EU Justice Ministry, which is our mm -hmm. state ag state advocacy agency, and so I'm talking with folks all the time, and I'm always trying to say, I want us to have a voice, and I want us to have a Unitarian Universalist voice. You know, we can be social justice activists, and many of us, you know, have long history or a history of being social justice activists in general, but I want us to be, you know, I want us to come from our faith. You know, I think that we could have a particular voice in the in the public square if we could learn to speak from that. So, so hearing about this kind of hostile environment and just try, and I'm really looking forward to um, to Lindy. Mm -hmm. You know, just seeing what she says and yeah. really wrestling with yeah. this. You know, how can we make ourselves comfortable? You know, not necessarily leading with "I'm a you you" and this is what I, but saying what we say and "I am a you you," right? Like both. So, yay! And, and James just, is back. I'm so glad James is back. And I just want to insert that I actually believe it is primarily our privilege and our comfort that has kept us from speaking out, and not our marginalization. Because in point of fact, being in today's media, being the minority gives you great access to media because they always want two sides of everything, if you dare to use it. So I did all the national media when the Promise Keepers came to Washington, D.C. because they wanted a counter voice. Uh -huh. And so I think if you dare to put yourself out there, I think there's actually limitless amount of public witness that people could be doing but it's not seen as our priority. Our congregations don't prioritize it for their ministers. Ministers get to it at the end of a really long thing. Our community ministers and other people, a lot of UUs are doing it not as UUs. They're doing it from other platforms. But right. James, we're all so excited to hear your answer to Patrice's question. Do you remember <laughs> it now? Well, well, I gave a very beautiful and concise <laughs> Thank then, you for that. <laughs> well, and there was this moment when I realized it was just like preaching on Sunday, and <laughs> no <nobody was> looking. <laughs> so, <laughs> lost to me. Uh, uh, I'm sure you all leapt in and saved the day. No, yeah, we really yeah, came yeah. to hear your answer. <laughs> we punted. We punted. Uh, Show your blog here, uh, Monkey Mind. In lieu of you, this would be part of you that we would show. So this is your blog here at Pathios Blogs, Monkey Mind. And this is a post that Meg thought was really good, um, Death, Love, and Mausole a Mausoleum. But I really like your blogs, James, because at the end you always have a video. And, um, and I think that's a new... I haven't seen any other bloggers who... Um, and that way. Um, so, and it's always very short too. It's almost like, I don't know, we have a thing called the daily compass at the CLF where it's just like two to three sentences, a daily meditation. And that's how I feel like your blogs are and where you just have, you know, three paragraphs usually or even less and then a picture and a video. That seems to be the monkey mind formula. Am I right? That's, that's the basic formula. I do try to write a, a a thinky piece uh, at least once a week and I archive my sermons as well so I, I hope that gives enough of a rhythm to it uh, that that people find something worth dipping into and so far you know I've been doing it for a long time and uh, 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 you know, Patheos picked it up which is it was a great gift to me because I'm living proof that any idiot who can string a couple of words together in a vaguely <laughs> coherent manner can blog. But, but when I was on my own and just trying to put it together, it, it, being my own tech support was not a good thing. And so mm. I'm very grateful to Patheos for, for picking it up. Yeah, mm. Patheos is also, there's a UU Collective blogging at Quest for Meaning with Patheos. It's a great place and they love our voices. They People like Tom Shade could also blog there if they wanted to do that instead of holding down their own fort. I mean, I think there are a number of venues like that. Huffington Post is dying for content. That's what I mean when I say if we took the time, we could be in the airwaves all the time if, if we made that our priority. So, um, and I'm, I'm all for that. I think that's fabulous. And just like everyone else, 
at the end of the day, no one says you have to do it. A lot of days I don't. I mean, James, you have the discipline of the dailiness, which must feel like a constraint sometimes. It's but. close to daily. Uh, I there was for about five years. I was I, that was my discipline. Was trying to make sure that I did something every every day. I think for the last two years, I I probably average about four days a week that I put content up. Uh, maybe a little. Maybe it averages a little bit more. Yeah. See, whereas I put eleven people together and figured between us we'd blog three times, three four <laughs> times a week. <laughs> And that works pretty well. <laughs> well, the problem with like with what Tom does, he does these kind of heavy think pieces, and so there might be a week or two between between entries, and I'm afraid people will forget to come back and visit. So, there you, go. you think we have all got monkey minds? Right. And I've got a monkey mind. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is it is absolutely an appropriate we make. Well, now one thing I love about your Facebook stuff, James, is that you are very um, verbal about struggling with sermon writing and I never know is that really true or do you just have fun like posting that I mean you I don't know anybody else who like grumbles as much as you do publicly all of us do it privately but public grumbling about how hard it is to write sermons is that just for fun uh, I, it's all of the above uh, uh, it's just for fun and it's true uh, I yeah, yeah. Uh, I uh, uh, and I just I think complaining is a is a minor spiritual practice, and I uh, I cultivate it as uh, you know as an important part of my life, and and I love Facebook because you can you know you get your little complaint out, and uh, and then there's validation. Everybody else says, yeah, it sucks too. Uh, so is yeah. that your advice to us as a Buddhist priest then to complain a lot? <laughs> just just clarifying here, uh, which hat you're wearing. I. I <laughs> I have been told by several authorities on the matter that I'm a very bad Buddhist priest. <laughs> Is it that W in the Buddhist? <laughs> when, tell us the story. When did you get ordained as a Buddhist priest? Oh, the Buddhist, oh well, when I was a child uh, um, in, in the 1960s, late 1960s, uh, I had abandoned. I, I I I rejected my Baptist upbringing. I uh, let's see. I think the thing was, if I recall correctly, I think at 16 I became a Fabian. At 17 I became an atheist, and at 18 I was I was wandering and trying to find the right something. And I had a brief a brief romance with uh, Vedanta, by way of Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood and that. That crowd, uh, but it didn't. It was it was a fairly cerebral thing, and the the insipid. I, I began to pick up this purity aspect to it that I knew was not me, and uh, uh, I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, and and I I was you know looking for some kind of spiritual grounding. I I figured out relatively quickly that psychedelics were not going to save the world. And uh, I suspected it had something to do with being present, and and people kept telling me about this this Japanese missionary over in San Francisco, uh, Shunru Suzuki, and uh, I be began sitting in one of the branches of his his group. It was already a rather large community, and and I had no uh, no real access to him. He was mostly, to my mind, Shunru Suzuki was this very small figure very far away in a large hall speaking in what my friends assured me was English. <laughs> and finally there was a, a, a British Zen priest blew into town, Hon Jiu Kinnett, and I attached myself to her and she ordained me a priest in, I think I was ordained a novice priest in like 1969 and received transmission, Dharma transmission in 1971, but I was really not happy with the quality of my insight and I left and began a quest that would eventually find my path which was uh, some 30 years ago when I found a different kind of Zen school that uh, it, that more emphasized being in the world and Unitarian Universalism and at that time I think more true than today uh, 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 Unitarian Universalism had a wonderful social face uh, um, um, and and absolutely nothing 
spiritual, and at least in the circles I was moving. And, and Zen Buddhism was very inward turned, uh, very good on the spiritual disciplines, but had almost no manifestation. And I became sort of that first part of that first crop of people who, uh, this, the Buddhist with kids, you know, becoming uh, UUs. And uh, so the ordination thing has been part of my life. It was a current that I tried to get away from uh, a number of times, but uh, um, uh, apparently it's a, a priest forever after the order of, I don't know, Mahakashapa or something. And uh, uh, it's been kind of cool. You know, I'm deeply involved in the Soto Zen Buddhist Association. I'm, uh, uh, and they're in this kind of interesting formative stage as, a, as, a, as an institution in which they, they tend to listen to my grousing uh, about institutional matters and they think I know something and I don't tell them the truth and so you know I get to inflict opinions here and there and once in a blue moon they actually uh, you know, seem to, to find it worthwhile. So it's, it's a lovely life. It's a good life. Fascinating, you know. It makes me think we had Florence, Florence, who's last name. On her way to being the second Unitarian yes. with uh, minister yes. and Soto Zen Buddhist priest. And right. Finally, we're going to get a good one. So that's, <laughs> that's what she said. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking with her last night, and she was saying how wonderful you are with your time that you spend with her. And so, yeah, I think it's a mutual admiration society. <laughs> you know, she's going to take on the, the mantle and I hope inspire a few more. Uh, to go well, I wondered, I mean, how it was to go from the West Coast where Buddhist, you know, <laughs> Buddhism is present in virtually any UU church you walk into out West, whereas in the East, maybe, maybe there's a bell, you know, but maybe nothing. Uh, how is it to be in Providence in an I'm, old New England church? And I'm the third called minister of this church to identify as a Buddhist. When, when they did the survey, when First Unitarian, and this is by the by, uh, since I am retiring in a year for any aspiring uh, parish ministers, uh, when they did the survey that led ultimately to my call, 40% of the congregation identified Buddhism as a significant theological factor in their individual thinking. Now, it's UU, so mostly that means they've read a few books, uh, uh, but usually more than one. Bookstore Buddhists, right? Yeah. Yeah, we call them lamp, uh, uh, lamp, 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 was it lamp table Buddhists? Uh, oh, I hadn't that. heard that before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and and so it's oh, it's been a, a an amazingly good trip. I've been uh, I've never been happier as a parish minister than in the First Unitarian Church of Providence. Uh, somebody's gonna somebody's gonna inherit something really nice. A few messes I made, they all have to clean up, but. But other than that, it's great. And you all get to come to General Assembly and see it. You know, well, well, tell us what we want to see while we're there at General Assembly. What are you, what, what are you, what are you proud of that, to be well, sure that people know about? Well, Providence, Providence is a wonderful town. I mean, and, you know, uh, um, uh, Rhode Island itself is, is famous because, you know, we, it, it, was, it was founded by somebody who uh, believed in the separation of church and state. And... Uh, uh, there is, even though there's, even though this identifies as a Catholic state uh, these days by majority, when marriage equality came along in the in the vote coming in the in the surveys coming right up to marriage equality, the Roman Catholics uh, of identif self-identified Roman Catholics of this state by I forget what it was 70 percent favored marriage equality. It was. Uh, it's it's in the DNA of being a, 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 a being a, a Rhode Islander, uh, known in in the early days as Rogue Island for its uh, descent. Uh, it's a lovely little city. Uh, you're going we're all gonna be downtown. Uh, if you if you walk over and across the bridge uh, to the river, and we should return to the river uh, and up the hill, then you have you're on College Hill, and that's where. Where our congregation is, there's there's two other congregations right in downtown uh, right now. Bell Street Chapel, which I really love, a little a little feisty social justice community. Uh, um, First Universalist is this kind of delightfully uh, 
Um, it's like a it's it's like 19th century Christian universalism frozen in amber. So it's, it's like Downton Abbey with, like with Abbey. universal salvation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a hoot to visit. Uh, uh, and then you go up to us. We're we're you know we're this uh, uh, we're the New England meeting house on steroids. <laughs> Uh, back to that reference to the 15-foot high pulpit. Uh, and any minister is invited to come and stand in that pulpit. Actually, anybody's welcome to come and stand in that pulpit. <laughs> and that and, was, sort of, I thought, Tom's comment. And James, where can I get? Where can we get hot dogs in the middle of the night? So uh, there, there are these food, food trucks uh, all down... Um, um, uh, that in Kennedy Square, that should be around there. There's going to be one food truck in particular, and I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember its name. That has been there since since it was dragged there uh, by horses. Uh, uh, that specializes in, in hot dogs. Uh, uh, there, the place for maybe a few more of us, actually just up the hill on on what is it Broadway, uh, is the Grange, and. In, down the, in the town just next to us, Pawtucket, which is where I currently live, uh, there is a world-class vegetarian restaurant called the Garden Grill. Now that's too far to visit, but they uh, people come up from Boston to eat there. Uh, the Grange is on Broadway, straight up the hill from the from the Dunk Duncan Donut Center. And is that the Dunk? Is that why it's the Dunk? I'm like, what is this Dunk? dunk. Yeah, it's the Dunk from Dunkin' Donuts. Um, Thanks to you know being able to buy names. Uh, uh, so is Dunkin' Donuts centered in Providence then? No, it's, actually, it's in Quincy. Quincy. I mean, I knew it's out there somewhere because there's a Dunkin' Donuts on every corner. There's a Dunkin' Donuts on every corner. Yeah. But 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 the, yeah, right. But but uh, but our convention, even though they talk about it being at the at the Rhode Island Convention Center, it's really at the Dunkin' Donuts Convention Center. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah that's where it is. It's at the Dunk. Meet yeah, at the Dunk. But I want to hold up the Grange if you want to. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm an omnivore, but I go to the Grange a lot, and and some vegetarian restaurants in the past I go to and I feel sad, uh, and um, I go to the Grange and I feel happy. So I I want to pitch it. If you come up the hill, there's just it's a little bit of a walk, but but there are two areas that are really worth going to. Uh, Thayer Street, which is the the, the college town area for. Um, two colleges are up there: Brown University and and the RISD, uh, the Rhode Island School of Design. You can kind of tell the difference between the kids because the RISD kids tend to have two; they look like Hank, uh, uh, but younger. But younger, right, 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 right. They know ink, and uh, uh, lovely. If you want, you know, not a hot dog, but there is uh, East Side Pockets is one of the finest. You know, Mediterranean style food, and there's a place called Baja Tex-Mex. If you're into mission style burritos, uh, um, they they're they're really good. They're you know really good. So there's a lot of food. There's a lot to see, and there is a uh, um, um, water fire. So tell us about water fire and what. Um what difference it makes if Unitarian Universalists go there or not during GA to you as a per person there? Uh huh. Okay. Well, just as a, a first as a community booster, Providence was uh, was was a suffering town, and I mean we still have a lot of financial problems. But but when I first came here, uh, people kept talking about the the, the criminal mayor, uh, uh, Buddy Cianci. And somebody handed me a copy of the Prince of Providence uh, to read, and the kind of the. I, I believe that was me. It was Hank Purse, actually. <laughs> yes, but I was I was going to let him off the hook on that one, uh, and, and I come from California. I mean, we have a lot of problems, but we don't. But corruption's not a big one. You know, it's it's just incompetence and uh, and mean spiritedness and the general things that you do in politics. It's a you know, it's, uh, Providence was you know was uh, uh, Buddy CNC went to prison twice. Uh, he went to prison the first time for among other things putting a cigarette out in the face of of, of his ex-wife's boyfriend. Uh, the uh, although he, he denies that just 
or whatever that's worth. And the second time is for straightforward corruption. Uh, uh, there's, we're in the midst of a new, there's nobody really stepping forward as a candidate for the, for the for mayor right now. Uh, the current mayor, who's pretty popular, is running for, for uh, governor. And uh, Buddy has thrown, said, you know, I might run again. And he's getting a lot of people who want to come back. And Tom, all right. James, what about you? Me? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, I, back to Aren't you Tom. retiring? <laughs> I, uh, I am retiring. I'm, I'm going home. I'm going to California. Uh, uh, but I, I want to. I'm circling around. This 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 town was really in, down on it on uh, on its heels, and Buddy didn't do it, but he but he allowed it. He encouraged it. He was like a Renaissance prince. Uh, on the one hand, a total thug. You know. On the other hand, he fostered the arts. Uh, uh, he got tax breaks for people. He uh, allowed the people who had been advocating for years and were kept blocked, being blocked from the, the, the river that runs right through the town had been covered over. He had it, he allowed it to be torn open and there's, and, and he, uh, you know, inaugurated it by riding in a gondola down the, uh, 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 down the thing. Um, one of the big events that sort of shows the, the, the renaissance of Providence and it's, and, it, and it, uh, the fact that it is this destination town for young people. I believe currently on uh, at least one magazine has said it's the number one uh, town to be 30 in uh, if you have a college degree. Uh, uh, but Waterfire is, they, they have these, these giant uh, um, containers of logs and things and there's this kind of elaborate ritual of lighting these bonfires after dark uh, and there are these gondolas and there's music and there's it's a it's a festive event uh, it's really a, a delightful walk around uh, a glorious time to be together we are doing a peace witness um, um, in our community at, sponsored out of our church there had been there's been an annual peace walk for a couple of years now uh, uh, Put together by Jenny Fox uh, of the Peace Flag Collective here in our in our community, where at that time a, a hundred or two hundred people marched through uh, uh, the, the the midst of this event, uh, <laughs> carrying uh, um, candelabra or um, what do you call the, the the lights in a in a, in a paper torches bag. torches well not torches but but this and kind rakes of, like Frankenstein and then oh sorry. Yeah, well, that's the problem with having having uh, <laughs> the talisons. <laughs> yes, uh, there's something kind of beautiful. We have been, as a community, you know, pretty here in this town, really rolling on. You know, we achieved marriage equality uh, just uh, just uh, a year ago, and we were the last state in New England, and mm. and uh, I'm hoping we will be partially celebrating a little bit of that. Uh, I think. The UUA has been very much on a on a roll. Um, we've done, you know, last, you know, the G, Justice GA was this amazing thing. I would like us to. I'm hoping. What I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, is that following the worship service on Saturday, uh, we're going to be invited to go straight from the worship service and participate in a very large version of this of this march of flame. Uh, uh, as part of the water fire, and I think it's just going to be uh, a moment in time that many people will remember. I think it will touch many hearts, uh, our own, and I think the the community, larger community who witness uh, this will be uh, uh, um, uh, very much touched. We we have more practical things we're doing as well. Of course, there's uh, we have some issues around. Um, Fair wages and union organizing. Yes, I believe that GA participants are familiar with the hotel yeah, struggles there. The hotel issue, and we're going to be, you know, standing up and talking about that at, at, in the appropriate moments as well. Uh, um, so there's there's plenty of opportunity, but this is going to be a little bit more contemplative moment, a, a time to to draw on the silent heart and the witness um, in 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 that way, and I I think it may be. One of the more memorable events of I've been to I don't know what at this point 25 GAs. Um, I'm hoping for this little spot uh, to be one of the great uh, great moments of uh, 
of the bouquet collected in my heart of what's you know what what I've experienced in general assembly. So is it kind of a Buddhist? You you're kind of a witness you're describing. I mean, it's really a. Yeah. Um, it's not something to leverage numbers as power to change a system. That's not what you're describing. You're describing a more of an internal communal well, witness. Right. The only revolution, as they say. Uh, certainly, I see it as a Buddhist, um, and my Christ and I think Hank would see it as a theist, uh, um, and I think a humanist would see it as. A, I mean, it's this thing that we do where our hearts come together. Uh, we, we are distinct and discreet and different, and there are places where we join together. And you know, the silent presence is one of those moments where we all, you know, the differences are transcended, uh, even as we come there as we are. Uh, well, I always think. Oh, you muted, right. Meg. Meg muted herself. I, I think there of uh, Dick Gilbert saying that when Jesus was on the cross, the people who would later be Catholics knelt at his feet and wept, and the people who would later be UUs went out and organized against the death penalty. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, our our kind of witness is less the kneeling at the cross. <laughs> I know, I love that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really glad to hear you describe this, James, because I was imagining uh, more of a, a party kind of thing. I don't know why. Um, I think I saw something like this somewhere in Europe, a video of something similar, and so I thought I, I was thinking it was going to be more like that. So this sounds great. It is a party. There is a party going on. There are street vendors. There will be mines and, and all this. Oh, okay. And offering right down the middle of that, this, 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 this witness, this witness. So you get it's the best of all worlds. Yeah, it's, mime, it's witnessing in the midst mime. of the world, not in a monastery, basically, right? <laughs> yeah, it's bringing it to the world. And boy, the world's there. And then afterwards, uh, I think Hank is desperate for the hot dog, and there will be several vendors. And now, should we bring, like, swim trunks to this thing? Is that what we should do? Or, or do we have to bring our own boats? Can we, get a, can we rent gondolas for this? Come as you are. <laughs> and I'll have my kids. It'll be good. It's okay for them too. Be like, there's no oh, new. Oh, you know, oh, there's mines, but there's no. Wonderful for kids. Kids. It is a family. I mean, even the party part is a family event. Uh, is Providence event. itself family friendly? Okay. Is it okay for me to bring my children to Providence? Is that okay? Uh, the kids <laughs> welcome. There may be a block. There may be a roadblock. Uh, looking for Hank Purse. Uh, <laughs> I was just thinking. What, will any of us be surprised if we see Hank floating down in a gondola now? <laughs> or, or, or just my body, lifeless body, floating down the river. <laughs> or, uh, you know, a redneck. Uh, if that happens, that'll be the man. Dog in hand. Uh. You know, a redneck yacht club of like all these uh, inner tubes lashed together, and Hank in a uh, in a goofy hat with a. Uh, you know, a, a beer hat with no hat doesn't drink. So I don't you know, drink. Yeah, no. You know, but uh, on top of a mind. Out, you know, no, no shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it, it could happen. Okay, all right. Yeah, it could happen. You know, I'm gonna Start rappel up. right down onto the water. Okay. What's this okay. repelling thing? Two of two of our members now have said they won this. Uh, Patrice is repelling. Patrice. Yes, I'm repelling. I'm yeah. very excited. <laughs> I was invited to repel, but I refused. I <laughs> said, "Line me up and shoot me before I repel." Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Man, you lost the short. You drew the short. <laughs> People think of themselves as having won something, oddly enough, with this repelling thing. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty got, excited. <laughs> we've got a whole CLF block. Shauna, who's behind the uh, talus, is also repelling. No, well, well, I don't know. <laughs> what I can't wait for is the, the CLF dunk tank. That's what I'm really There you <laughs> go. Now, that would be fun. That would be very fun. Uh, we are, um, I'd love to hear what everyone's looking forward to at, C at uh, GA, because... 
there's so much to look forward to. Tom, oh. what are you looking forward to? You've been doing all this UUMA stuff. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what's coming up for me is, uh, you know, we're working on the UUMA Connect and getting uh, more people involved in that. And I'm also leading a worship service on uh, uh, Saturday morning in the, uh, you know, the pre-plenary pre worship service. And um, I'm also walking the stage at the Service of Living Tradition on the, uh, what do we call this, the penultimate fellowship, right, the, when you retire. You know, penultimate. So. Penultimate. penultimate. Then there's the time where the, you have the ultimate fellowship. Yeah, now, you Hank, know. you were talking about the ultimate thing. you got something going on about the ultimate. Yeah, one. you know, you... Uh, um, it used to be that uh, uh, years ago when, um, uh, when they read the names of the uh, uh, UU ministers uh, who, have, who have died this past year, they would ask people to stand as, as they were able, and then they stopped that for a while. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I always think it's a, it's a nice way to show respect. And so um, uh, in the past, I've asked, people, I've asked people to join me in standing during that time. Uh, and then uh, uh, the other day, um, Johanna, Johanna um, uh, said, "Hey, we need to, you know, let, let's let's remind folks to do that." And I went, "Right." And so I put it on um, the hot stove yesterday afternoon at like one, and by three, like I, there was this flurry of people writing in, but especially all these people in Michigan. And Tom, why don't you pick up the story? Because well, of we we were we were, we had a cluster lunch the other day, so there's about 10 of us around eating lunch, and somebody, uh, I think it was Lisa Presley who started on, why don't people stand anymore when we uh, call the names of the dead at, at Service of the Living Tradition, and we all got ourselves roused up about this, and, and unanimously agreed that this needed to happen, and that people said they would go home that day and write to Sarah Lambert and get and demand this, you know. And that we all were going to stand anyway, and we're all going to like you know wave our arms to bring people up, like we're, you know. Uh, but then, as the uh, as we're closing up the lunch, you know, people get on their phones as they do, and oh, Hank Pierce at the at the, the uh, hot stove hot stove report is already right away. It happened by the end Psychic. of the day. It had all happened. It was all. It was in the cosmic. Uh, you know, consciousness at that moment. Mm -hmm. So, so we're all going to stand. Speaking of cosmic consciousness, I'm going to be wearing a hat like this at GA. So look for me. There you go. You oh what? It? Oh my lord! This is, my, this is going to be the CLF hat. Our message for GA is: Hey, you can be a member of a bricks and mortar and CLF. You can have <laughs> two congregations. So look for silly hats. Lots of people plan on fun stuff. Um, ah. uh, Patrice, what are you most excited about? You're wearing about 30 hats while you're there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just enjoy being with, uh, with my people writ large. It on, honestly almost doesn't even matter. It's just, uh, it, just if, it just fills me up to, to be able to look out and just see so many Unitarian Universalists in one place. So... Mm. Everything else is gravy after that, yeah, honestly. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Well, we will be filming Tuesday next week at 11. Uh, we'll be standing around outside of the U Ministers Association, nabbing interesting people who are skipping out on the second half of the Marshall Gantz talk. So if you got something you want to say, come and visit us. And uh, I'll wear my silly hat so you can find us. And... Um, uh, yeah, we'll be out there. We'll be out there filming, and uh, we'll come to you live. And then we're going to take a break after that. So that'll be that'll mm. be the end of June, and then July. We'll just ooh, you'll just have to live without the view. I know that's hard to imagine. Live, with rerun, <laughs> rerun, so, summer reruns. Yeah. So um, yeah, you can you can watch reruns. Sixty-five episodes, folks. There you go. Sixty-five episodes we've done. You know, so a lot of episodes, and I'm, I've hired my 17-year-old to go through some of them this summer and pull out highlights so that, you know, when James says something really pithy, we can just put that as its own little video. And as a novelty. On his blog, you know. Was that, oh, the, the TH. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's what I said. Okay. Thank you. James, Thank you got you. anything else you want to say there? Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it. Have a great week, all. See you next week. See you, Gia. See ya.